the first thing we need to consider is what we're going to do with our laser exhaust. For anyone out there that's unfamiliar with the process, when you laser cut or laser engrave something, you're essentially vaporizing that material and a byproduct of that process is going to be generating smoke, fumes, and particulate matter. All of which needs to be promptly evacuated from your laser and your workspace for your own health and safety. And the majority of time that means exhausting the smoke and fumes outside. Now, if you live in a house or work out of a building that looks something like this, where you don't have anyone in close proximity to you, this is probably a non-issue. But if you're working out of a situation like this or like this, exhausting directly outside could potentially be an issue. Potentially is the key word here. Lasering wood kind of smells like someone's having a campfire out back, but laser cutting, let's say acrylic, has a pungent plastic smell that's kind of nasty. It's not uncommon at all for close neighbors to complain about the smells from your cutting and engraving, and depending on where you live, it might be something you have to think about ahead of time. If you don't have the option to exhaust outside, there is a solution for you, fume extractors. I actually have three fume extractors because the building I was working out of when I bought this laser behind me didn't allow direct exhausting outside. How the fume extractor works is you connect it to the exhaust port of your laser, and it will clean the smoke and fumes by passing it through a series of filters, usually a pre-filter, a HEPA filter, and finally an activated charcoal filter. After that, the clean air is just recirculated into your workspace. Pros of getting a fume extractor are, you can laser anywhere you want and not worry about exhausting outside. The cons of getting a fume extractor, well, the ones that are good and actually work well are really expensive. For example, my filter box here costs about three grand and each one of these replacement filters can run a few hundred bucks each. The top filter here, the charcoal filter, cost me $400 each time I need to replace it. If you do decide to go the fume extraction route, I'll give you my two biggest pieces of advice as someone who owns them. Make sure the CFM rating of your laser and your fume extractor match up. And number two, ask how much the replacement filters are because they will be a recurring cost you're gonna have to deal with. The second thing we need to consider is what kind of software we're going to be using because not all software is good. I guess that's the best way to put it. If you're new to this, I'll let you know right now, the majority of your time will be spent sitting in front of a computer screen clicking buttons. So it makes sense that the quality of the software you're using can really impact your learning curve, your end projects, and most importantly, your enjoyment. This is supposed to be fun. Traditionally, laser software has been pretty bad. It was just assumed that you were gonna figure it out. But with the influx of hobby level lasers and hobby level consumers into the laser space, the software has gotten much more user friendly over the past few years. When shopping around, you'll run into one of two scenarios. Scenario number one, the laser you wanna buy comes with its own proprietary software created by the manufacturer specifically for their lasers. Let me show you a couple quick examples and also show you how you can figure out whether or not the laser you're looking at comes with its own proprietary software. First example, we'll look at the Xtool S1, a pretty popular entry level laser engraving machine. What you're gonna to wanna to do is scroll all the way down towards the bottom until you see a section that looks like a grid like this. Most laser uh, websites will have this and you want to go to the software section right here. And what does it have listed? So this one has XCS slash Lightburn. So XCS stands for Xtool Creative Space, which is Xtool's proprietary software. They even have an, their own page on the Xtool website dedicated to their software, which you can go ahead and download wherever you want. Proprietary software isn't something that just applies to the hobby level, entry level laser engravers. This also applies to the high-end machines. So here is an example from Epilog Laser. Epilog is a really high-end laser engraving machine. The prices on these things are pretty high. So let's see what they offer. Again, we're going to scroll all the way down. And here under the section print driver and software, we see laser dashboard with a trademark and epilogue job manager with a trademark. Those are epilogue's proprietary software for operating the epilogue lasers. And last example, let's look at a pretty infamous laser here on YouTube, the Glowforge. So again, I'm going to scroll down to find the tech specs of the Glowforge. 
and we have a section called software and basically it runs through all of the specs of the software they don't specifically name their software but they do have their own software it has its own website or has its own page on their website and it's called Glowforge Print. The majority of the time when a laser manufacturer has their own proprietary software like that, you have to use that software. Your laser won't be compatible with any third-party options like in the case of the Epilogues and Glowforge that we looked at. Some companies like Xtool, for example, really, really want you to use their software, Creative Space, but they offer some limited compatibility with third-party software like Lightburn. You can use it, but for all the bells and whistles, you have to use Creative Space. And when I'm using my X-Tool lasers, I always use Creative Space because it's gotten really good. Scenario number two, the laser you want to buy doesn't come with any proprietary software, but instead it recommends compatible third-party options. This approach is actually very common. First up, here's a listing for the Eon Mirror Pro. And again, if we scroll down, go to the specs section, we can see, let's see where it is here. Keep going. Under engraving software, we have Lightburn and RD Works. Another example, this one's from the company OM Tech. Again, we scroll down, scroll down. And we see here, bundled software, RD works, compatible software not included, Lightburn. And for our last example, this is a cloud ray fiber laser. Scroll down. And we see under support operating software, EasyCAD 2 slash Lightburn. The kind of software available is going to depend on the type of controller your laser uses. We're not going to get into that. But I'll cut to the chase. If you're buying a laser that requires third-party software and is Lightburn compatible, just get Lightburn. Yes, it does cost a little bit of money, but it's by far the best option out there. And there are tons of resources to help you get started. Before Lightburn was on the market, I was using software called RD Works, and I wanted to smash my head through a brick wall multiple times a week because it was such a bad user experience. Lightburn could cost three times as much as it does now, and we would all still pay it. Don't tell them that though. Whichever laser you're considering, I highly suggest looking up what kind of guides and tutorials are out there already on the software you'll be using. You can even go one step further and download the software ahead of time to check it out. Obviously, you won't be able to connect to a laser, but you can at least get a feel for what it looks like and if there's any compatibility issues with your computer and operating system. For example, a lot of the free third-party software can't be run on the Mac, while paid options like Lightburn are completely compatible. The third thing we need to consider is our workspace, where you're physically going to store and operate your laser. Lasers require electricity, airflow, sometimes water. They can be stinky, they can be super heavy, they can be loud. All of these things have to be accounted for when deciding where to set up shop. First, let me show you the three main types of lasers out there and give you a rough look at how much space they take up. First, let's check out a couple tabletop gantry lasers. They're called tabletop lasers because they're designed to sit on a table. Pretty self-explanatory. This is a pretty popular uh, incarnation of a tabletop laser. This is the Xtool D1 Pro diode laser. And the benefits of a laser like this is it doesn't really take up a lot of space. It's nice and light. You can pick it up and you can move it around. So if you're working in a situation where you don't have a permanent home for a laser or you have really uh, tight working quarters, something like this style laser might be a great option. Staying in the tabletop gantry category, this is also a diode laser. This is the X-Tool S1. Now, as you can obviously see, this machine is quite a bit more involved than the one we just saw. It comes with an enclosure, and with the enclosure comes with more space requirements. It takes up a little bit more space on your tabletop. It's quite a bit heavier, but still not completely impossible to move around if you had to move it around to different places. Moving up in size and weight, we have the tabletop CO2 lasers. This is my tabletop CO2 laser, the X-Tool P2. This style laser is going to have an even wider footprint on the table and a significant increase in weight. You need at least two people to carry one of these things around. It's full of delicate glass and delicate mirrors. It has water running through it. 
it's a much more involved machine than the previous two we just looked at. Now, once you leave the realm of the tabletop gantry lasers, you move into the realm of the standalone gantry systems like this laser here. This is my standalone CO2 laser, the Boss LS1630. Standalone in this case, just meaning you're not gonna be putting it on a tabletop, it's gonna have its own floor space. I'm actually in the process of getting a new CO2 laser to replace this one, and I can't wait to show you guys what it is. But for now, let's talk about some of the characteristics. As you can see, obviously it is much larger than any of the lasers we've looked at so far. And the funny thing is this is on the small side of this style laser. They get much larger and much heavier than this. This one right here weighs about 600 pounds without all of the added accessories that you need. So if you're considering a laser like this, you're gonna need to make sure you have plenty of floor space. For our last example, let's take a look at Galvo style lasers. I have two Galvo lasers right here. I guess these can be considered tabletop lasers since they do sit on tabletops, but they are fundamentally different styles of laser than the other ones we looked at today. Uh, anytime you see a laser that's built vertically, more like a tower than um, compared to the other lasers we saw that were built more like boxes, uh, that is going to be a Galvo laser. This is my OMG fiber laser. This is the one I use to mostly do metal engraving. So like coins and uh, bottle openers and stuff like that. And this is my X-Tool F1 Ultra, which I also do metal in here. I also do coins, but it is a split laser system. So I can also do stuff like leather and wood and things like that, that a true fiber laser isn't as well suited for. As far as workspace goes, the benefit of Galvo style lasers is, as you can see, they don't take up a whole lot of space. I have two of them right here, right next to each other, and I could fit another two on this table if I wanted to. The big downside of Galvo lasers is the workspace is going to be much smaller, much more limited compared to the standalone CO2 gantry laser that we just looked at and even the tabletop gantry lasers that we saw earlier than that. I bring this up because your workspace is often going to dictate what kind of laser you'll be able to use. Size is a major consideration when choosing a laser. If your craft room is located on the fourth floor of your house and you have narrow hallways and narrow doorways, buying a laser like this isn't a great idea. Temperature. Some lasers, especially CO2 lasers, are sensitive to overly hot or cold environments. Lasers can overheat in the hot weather, and in the case of CO2 lasers, the glass tubes can actually crack if the room is too cold. So if you're planning on working on your laser in a room that's not climate controlled, like a garage, please consider what the hottest and coldest days of the years are like where you live and make sure you prepare accordingly. Airflow. We touched on this at the beginning of the video, but you need to make sure you have adequate airflow into the room so it can replace the air that's being exhausted out of your laser when it's working. If you have more air leaving the room than coming into the room, you can get what's called negative pressure and it will affect how well your laser works. Electrical. If you're looking to get one of the smaller entry level lasers, this might not be a huge deal, but if you're opting for a larger laser like this one here, they often require their own 20 amp breaker to operate. Double check the electrical requirements on the laser you're interested in and make sure to factor in any accessories that need power as well. Again, back to my setup here, I have the laser, I have the water chiller, the air assist, and this fume extractor all need to be running at the same time. You can see I had a dedicated sub panel installed in my garage to make sure everything is set up right and organized. The fourth consideration we're going to discuss today is what kind of laser support do you think you're going to need because this might be a determining factor on what brand you decide to buy from. A rule of thumb is when comparing similar lasers from different brands, the cheapest options often come with less customer support from the company and the more expensive ones come with more support. That's why you can buy a no-name laser off eBay for often significantly less money than the popular brands because once you get it, well, you're on your own. When narrowing down what kind of laser you wanna buy, make sure to take a look at the support section on their website. Do they offer phone and video support or is it all email based? What kind of hours is the support staff working? Do they have any staff based in your country or is everything overseas? If you're really new to laser engravers, it's plausible you'll be spending some time asking questions to support until you get on your feet. I've been doing this for over 10 years and still have to contact support from time to time. I don't know everything. 
This is why I also only buy from laser brands that have a track record of good customer support. It's important to me. I'm operating a business here, and if something goes wrong with my machine, I love knowing I have someone I can reach out to and get help. The last thing we're going to talk about today is the most important on the list when it comes to things you need to consider before buying your laser. Is the laser you want to buy actually compatible with the kinds of things you want to make? Do you even know what you want to make? Look, I'm part of many, many different Facebook laser groups, probably too many. My feed is absolutely out of control. And one of the things I see posted at least once a day is someone trying to figure out how to engrave or cut a material that isn't going to work with the laser they bought. To prove my own point, I logged on to Facebook and immediately saw this post in my feed. The issue this person is having is the laser in question, the F1, isn't going to be able to cut light blue acrylic because that color and material combination isn't compatible with the F1 laser wavelength. Now, this might be a minor inconvenience to this person, but what if you bought that laser specifically to cut light blue acrylic? That would be a costly mistake. I love making these engraved brass coins, but in order to do so, I need to have a fiber laser like this or something like the F1 Ultra here. If I didn't do my due diligence ahead of time and decided to drop five grand on a laser like this one over here, I would have just wasted all that money because there's no way on God's green earth I will get the result I want with that kind of laser. So please, please have an idea of the kinds of projects you want to make ahead of time and cross-reference those ideas with the material lists on the laser product page. If you still aren't sure, ask someone like me or contact the sales department to verify. Anyways, good luck with your new laser. I hope you enjoy it as much as we do on this corner of the internet. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.